What we did in Haiti changed disaster response forever. Um, I don't know if I can overstate that. What we did uh, ended up creating partnerships between the military, between the open source community, between governments, and most importantly, between the affected population, the Haitian people. I want to step back for a moment to the tsunami. We can remember how many hundreds of thousands of people died. I had friends who were running the UN response in Banda Aceh. They waited three weeks to get imagery. In the meantime, they didn't know where the IDP camps were. They didn't know where routes were. They fought. It wasn't because the imagery wasn't collected. It was because it wasn't released. Let's look at Haiti. We waited 26 hours. I cannot tell you how much of a difference this made. Within three weeks this time, we had eight centimeter imagery from the World Bank. They had flown an aircraft into Dun LIDAR and given it out in public domain. That wasn't the only thing that was different. We ended up getting texts directly from people trapped under concrete. We responded. Instead of voyeuristically reading these in the news, we acted. There was a team at Tufts Fletcher School, which deserves an incredible amount of credit. Um, Ushahidi stood up an instance. Patrick Myers here and talked about it. Uh, within two hours of the earthquake. These folks had four friends who were working on a mobile banking project for the World Bank. They didn't know their status. They ended up setting up an Ushahidi instance at Fletcher. They started mobilizing translators. They got 10,000 Haitians to contribute from the diaspora to translate messages in near real time from the SMS and social media that was coming in by Facebook and Twitter. And they ended up teaching 300 students how to geolocate these emails Facebook messages, and put them on a map, get them to the Red Cross, get them to UNDAC, get them to the US military, get them to the Coast Guard, and these were people saved in the rubble. Three things enabled this. They needed an SMS framework. They needed post-disaster imagery. And they needed, most of all, a place where they could collaborate and start making sense out of what was essentially a blank spot on the map and starting to notate where the roads were, where the camps were, and where people were trapped. Crisis camp mobilized in more than 20 cities, thousands of people, to start working with OpenStreetMap. Now, what I probably won't need to do is to show just how much of a web, with all due reference or, 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 or deference to XKCD's Lord of the Rings, um, for those of you who know it, trying to capture a map of the actors working through you had imagery collection. You had people who were working on aggregation. Uh, Christopher Smith, where are you? Thank you. Um, and then getting maps out so that all these other NGOs could start mapping it and start putting it onto uh, OpenStreetMap. Now, I can't overstate, OpenStreetMap saved lives. I want to give it to Jeff and talk through this. All right, I'm just going to talk about kind of how we did things with OpenStreetMap. And uh, for any of you that maybe been living on another planet for the last five years, uh, OpenStreetMap is Wikipedia for map data. Um, so this is like a pre-event look at uh, Port-au-Prince. And you can see there's a few roads, not very much annotation. Um, Post-event, people start adding road names, uh, building, you know, building footprints, um, the little blue symbols or the internally displaced persons camps. Uh, damaged buildings, hospitals, and this is about a week after the event the map got built up. Um, this is an animation of the tens of thousands of edits, so you can see the event here on the 12th, and then here is the edits going on. Um, it's about 1,000 people, 1,000 uh, unique users that uh, edited um, from imagery, from you know, base maps, imports of data. So this is the, you know, b about a week, uh, 10 days of, of uh, edits here. And um, we'll let this finish here. So it's all the edits. Um, but the key thing is how. How do, how do we do this? Uh, how, how did the you know, crowdsourced map come together? Um, I think there's four key technical factors. First was uh, <coughs> unprecedented release of imagery. Like John said, the imagery came out in a day. Um, and for the next 10 days, new imagery came out all the time. We had. Uh, Imports of existing data sets, um, 
lots of lots of existing data sets from the UN stabilization mission, from some came from the DOD. Um, and OSM is based on a flexible data schema that can evolve as it goes. It's not a kind of fixed uh, fixed schema, you know, normal ER type uh, type schema. And there's a pretty well understood tool set, open source stack that everything's built on. So just look at these um, four factors here. So this is the footprints of all the imagery that was released. And so the two commercial imagery providers, Digital Globe and GUI, released imagery under attribution license, um, essentially as soon as it was downlinked uh, and rectified. Uh, Google and the World Bank uh, both flew eight, 10 centimeter imagery and uh, lots of other JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, other, other agencies released their imagery as well. So they released the raw imagery but uh, some, some, some served up services as well. But uh, all that imagery had to be taken, processed, tiled, and uh, all that was done at a group called Telescience, which is down at the San Diego Supercomputing Center. And so it was all processed and tiled. Um, can't say enough how uh, proud we are of Chris Schmidt's efforts in that respect. And it was all published as web services. So this, uh, this is a, got mashed up, also served out as tiles, WMS, and like it'll be used by lots and lots and lots of people. Um, and also used a lot of uh, base data sets. So these are defense mapping agency maps. So as people digitized in uh, streets from the imagery, they, uh, they could use these old mid-90s maps to uh, label the street names, points of interest, that kind of thing. Also, like I said, imported data from UN stabilization mission, other data sets. Um, and also, for the first time, the military released P3 and Global Hawk imagery, uh, UAV and uh, high-resolution imagery. Um, this is kind of a typical analytics you know, uh, intelligence community analytic product, and you see the metadata is burned into the image, so um, it has to be then trans translated back out. And those not horribly useful for mapping, but it was definitely unprecedented that they released this kind of imagery. Um, and so a lot of this stuff was coordinated on the crisis mapping group, which is a, you know, a Ning social network and a mailing list. And so um, you have like pe people from all walks of, of life in geography, uh, academics, government, military, NGOs, and so, it's like a mail, very active mailing list where people are exchanging data. Um, so that's where a lot of things were coordinated. Um, and like I said, OpenStreetMap is based on a like, very flexible key value tagging scheme. And I heard it said that you know, if we did this uh, entry, entity relationship mapping, we'd still be talking about the schema today you know, months later. Um, and we really saw that in the health cluster. They're still going around <laughs> talking about how do we build a model for you know, what 380 fields do we need for the, this particular uh, hospital. Um, so, and, and again, the, the OSM stack is based on a lot of open source tools. Uh, there's a well understood API, so lots of people can build you know, extensions to it. In fact, even traditional GIS products now, Esri's uh, writing tools that you can edit OSM data in Esri, check it out, edit it, and push it back in. And um, so, all of this enabled these maps to be used on the ground. I'm going to turn it over to Skyler, who spent a week in uh, Haiti uh, on behalf of the World Bank, and uh, he's just going to tell you how these things got used. Thanks, Jeff. So, uh, so you've seen how the maps uh, were made, how OpenStreetMap was developed uh, from almost nothing in Port-au-Prince to a very, very detailed map by over 1,000 people over the course of a few weeks. Uh, so how were those maps used? Well, uh, here you can see a very blurry photo, OpenStreetMap on a GPS receiver uh, in the hands of a search and rescue worker in Port-au-Prince uh, and a, uh, a search and rescue worker from the Fairfax County, Virginia SAR team wrote into the OpenStreetMap project to say, I wish you could have seen my team members' eyes light up when I told them I was going to give them street-level maps on their GPS receivers. This had never been possible before. Um, a company called Gaia GPS put OpenStreetMap uh, on their, uh, in their iPhone app and, uh, and released uh, the, the, uh, the Haiti version for free. And uh, the result was that a lot of people were introduced to OpenStreetMap that might not have otherwise been. Uh, this, this gentleman here walked into the Ocha GIS tent at the Minister Logistics Base in Port-au-Prince while I was sitting there, right? And this, you can see his badge there. He's from the European Commission Humanitarian Aid, Aid Team. And, uh, and he walked in, he said, uh, I need maps, uh, preferably OpenStreetMap. Uh, Google Maps is okay, but, but really I want OpenStreetMap. And I was dumb, dumbstruck. I was like, well, how did you even find out about OpenStreetMap? And he's like, oh, well, you know, I downloaded these maps from my iPhone before I left for Belgium, and I didn't know that there were maps like this, and I, and I found out that OpenStreetMap is the best map that we have here in Haiti, and so uh, we're going to Petit Goave to find out how our food distribution network is working, and so I know I need maps, and so I thought I would come ask for OpenStreetMap. And this was incredible. This is not a person who's technical at all. He's not a geographer. He's not a map geek. This is just some guy who walked into the tent and was like, I need OpenStreetMap. It's incredible. So, so now we've looked at how these maps were used, right? Uh, oh, the, of course, I also would like to point out that the entire UN 
system, all of the UN agencies that were acting on the ground were also using OpenStreetMap for all of their print maps, which is really quite incredible. And I'll get to that a little bit later. Yeah, really quite incredible. Um, but uh, but so we, we've looked at how these maps were used, but I just want to give a little bit of time to why these maps were made. Right? It's a very interesting question. Um, so you all are probably familiar with Kosa's Penguin. Yochai Benkler describes how open source software development is made. And he characterizes it as uh, this sort of this system where uh, uh, the uh, product has a uh, marginal cost of distribution of effectively zero. You can download it off the internet for free. And so people get involved in contributing to uh, open source software or Wikipedia with a non-monetary motivation and work that they can do in discrete multi-size pieces with low cost to integrating those pieces, right? And uh, Steve Coast has previously characterized this for OpenStreetMap as being a job that's fun, that takes as little as five minutes, and it's easy enough to put the pieces together, right? And, um, and the OpenStreetMap project has gone so far as to make it so easy. This is a screenshot of a video made by Kate Chapman, uh, who's here, I think, who, uh, who basically the video is how to map roads for Haiti in OSM. And uh, this video is three minutes long. In three minutes, any of you can learn how to create, map, create roads in OpenStreetMap using overhead imagery. Um, so the thing is, like, we talk about open source software, we talk about how people are, you know, scratching their own itch, you know, when they contribute to these products. Uh, you know, Wikipedia, people are doing it because, oh, it's fun, you know? Uh, but, but actually, it's, it's sort of interesting to ask, right? Like, when a disaster happens, everybody's hearts go out. You want to participate, you want to contribute, you want to help people somehow. You're like, all right, I'll give, you know, five bucks to the Red Cross, but it doesn't feel like it's enough. You know, and suddenly, for the first time ever, we now have a set of conditions where individuals from the comfort and safety of their own home can literally help other people save lives in a disaster zone by contributing to product, projects like OpenStreetMap and Ushahidi. This is incredible. It's unprecedented. And it has changed the face of disaster relief forever. It has changed how this will be done forever after, which is really incredible. And people do this because it's rewarding, because their hearts go out and they want to help. And now they can. And uh, I just want to say, I'll just, you know, these, these two quick quotes here, I'm not going to read them out because we don't have time. Uh, but within the UN system, everybody was aware that, open that the OpenStreetMap contributors had done something that was unprecedented, had done something that if it was up to other agencies to do, it would have taken tens of thousands, hundreds, millions of dollars, and taken years. And the OSM community did it in a week, which is really incredible. Woo. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Unprecedented. OK, so now what? Can we repeat this? Can we make it sustainable? Is it something that, given Chile, it took five days to get the imagery out, we can now expect as a normal capability? We have some serious doubts. There are some serious limits. Volunteers have lives. They have families. They have creditors. Employers have to pay people. They have to keep a business model running. Open source leaders have to keep people involved. Uh, big players? So tell me. If everyone in this room, we got all the gifted geographers here, all the cartographers to start working on a map, and we built it for Haiti, how would you pay them? How would you give them hardware that you don't know you're going to get back? How would you think about creating a sustainable model for incorporating the data and validating it? How would you make sure that this is something that the affected population keeps inside of their country and doesn't become yet another international development project that becomes a, a burden in the long run? Um, there are... Uh, I'm noticing a number of large organizations going towards crowdsourcing. Well, it's not more than an SMS server. For crowdsourcing, generally, you require a crowd. You need the passion. You need the relationships. And those take time to build. That's something that has been a, a deep issue. Um, also, uh, there are some things here that I'd love to get through. I think we have no time left. Uh, Iterative versus comprehensive. Some people, we, we work by iteration. Most large organizations want a large form. They want to have everything done at once. Uh, we need to cooperate. And as part of that, what I'd like to do is propose figuring out a way to get to an ethical code of conduct. How do we do this in the future to make it sustainable and uh, repeatable? Uh, most of all, I'd like to see whether we could do this at Where Camp and at the Camp Roberts exercises that uh, I helped run. Uh, I also want to finish by giving acknowledgement to thousands of people that made the Haitian response possible. This yeah. applause will be the very first thing, the very first time that some of them have gotten recognition. Please give them a hand. <laughs>